for our friends who are watching, this is Sabbath School at Central Church. And this class that I teach here is really just one of many classes that are going, around, going on right now simultaneously throughout our church facilities. And we're glad those who are watching on television or the internet that you're joining us here at Central Church for our Sabbath School study time. We go through a quarterly, this is sort of an outline to help us study the Word. It's really a Bible study, but sometimes it's good to have outlines to help direct you, to ask the right questions, point you to the Scriptures so you can do a topical study. And we are in the second chapter of our study dealing with the fruits of the Spirit. Now those of you who are here part of this class, we are right now, this is December what, 18th, 19th? 19th. And uh, 2009, those who are watching, it is now 2010. And so uh, we study in advance in our class so that we could uh, broadcast at the same time the rest of the world church studies the lesson. And uh, so we can do it together as a church family. But um, if you don't have a copy of this, we hope you'll contact your neighborhood Seventh-day Adventist church and I'm sure they'll be happy to give one to you and so you can study along. Now I should also add at this point, we have a lot of people who are studying with us on the internet, part of our extended class here at Central Church and I don't know the exact number but we've got quite a few people from around the world who are some of our internet members of Central Church. They're real members here and we take them through a real process and we talk to them and uh, we got Pastor Luke here, he communicates with them, Pastor Harold. Um, some people are I isolated. There is no local church that they can attend and because of the um, miracle of the internet and sometimes people get connected through the satellite, they can be virtually at the North Pole if they've got clear weather and they can log on and study with us. And so we want to welcome you. If you're one of those people and you're isolated and you don't have a church that you can worship with, a local fellowship of course is the best thing, but uh, we can stay connected with you. Just go to saccentral.org. We'll talk to you about the process of being one of our online members. SacCentral.org. We want you to be connected with the family of God. So we're in lesson number two, dealing with a very important subject, talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And before we get into the lesson, we always like to provide a free offer. We have a new free offer that goes very well with our study today. It's called Love Without an If. Love Without an If by Jim Hornberger. And if you would like a free copy of that, just call the toll-free number 866-788-3966. And that's offer number 729. We'll send it to you for free. And that's uh, a good topic, good title for our study today. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Lesson number two, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We have a memory verse. Memory verse is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. You can all say this with me. You should have this memorized. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. You ready? And now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, before we dive into our study today, I thought it might be a good exercise for us to read together through, and you don't have to read out loud, but just at least follow along, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is so to, that it's sort of that golden passage in the Bible that gives you a biblical definition of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. That was our memory verse. By the way, <clears throat> what book is this in? 1 Corinthians. If you know anything about your Bible and you know anything about 1 Corinthians, Obviously God wrote this wonderful chapter on love to this particular church because this church had love down to a T. Is that right? Or did the first Corinthian church have love problems? So he wrote this to them because they had challenges with loving each other and understanding how to love. And so don't as we read this think, oh this is such a lofty standard of love. It's just not meant for me. He gave it to a church that was having some real internal challenges with loving God and loving each other. And so this really is applicable for everybody. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. Love is to be expressed in more than just sound. 
Did Jesus talk about people who draw near with their mouths, but their hearts are far? And by the way, when Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, did Paul speak with the tongue of angels? You know, some of our friends that read uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, dealing with the gift of tongues, they think that the gift of tongues, that heavenly language, is the tongue of angels, and Paul spoke the tongue of angels. He is not saying that here. Matter of fact, as we read on, you're going to find out when the, Paul uses the word though, that is more accurately translated even if. He's saying even if I spoke with the tongues of men, the languages of the earth, and even the languages of heaven, if I don't have love, it's just noise. And he articulates that by saying it's a clanging cymbal, a sounding brass. It's just noise. And because the Corinthian church was all arguing about the gift of tongues, so he said quite a bit to them. By the way, Paul says nothing about tongues in any of his other letters, even though he is the principal writer in the letters of the New Testament. So uh, keep that in mind. He doesn't say he speaks with the tongue of angels. He said, even if I did. And he goes on to say, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, did Paul understand all mysteries? Or were there some things he didn't understand? Who only understands all mysteries? Only God understands all mysteries. Paul wasn't claiming to be omniscient and know all mysteries. He said, even if I did, who knows more? Paul or the devil? The devil, he's got a lot of knowledge. He's got encyclopedic knowledge. Highest of God's angels. But he, he doesn't know everything either, does he? He's a created being. But does the devil love? So you can have, I mean, I've got a computer that knows a lot more than I know, but it doesn't love. You know what I'm saying? And so a person can have all kinds of knowledge. And have you met people before Boy, they can quote chapter and verse, and they've just, they carry an, an armload of books, and they got all the references in their mind, and they got a tremendous knowledge, and they're some of the honoriest people you ever met. <laughs> and, and so having a lot of knowledge is not the same thing for having a lot of love. Amen. And so Paul is saying, though I understand prophecy, you and I have met people before. They get the charts, and they get the graphs, and they understand all the horns and the hoofs of Daniel and Revelation. And, uh, and they'll beat you over the head with it. And if you don't agree with the date they fixed for the second coming, they can be mean and consign you to Hades. Uh, they don't have love, but they claim to understand prophecy. And though I have all knowledge so that I have all faith, and though I have all faith. Now, what does though mean again? Even if. Even if. He's not claiming to have all knowledge or all faith so that I can remove mountains. Mountain moving faith. Jesus used that as a, a metaphor to talk about the ultimate faith. You can move mountains. And I used to think when the Lord said that he was talking about literally transporting Everest or something. The Lord was really talking about that mountain of sin that is crushing us that is cast into the depths of the sea. Remember Jesus said if you've got faith you can say unto this mountain be plucked up and cast in the sea. I used to think that was talking about relocating one of the Sierras or something. He's really talking about the mountain of sin that is cast into the sea. God says he'll take our sins and cast them into the depths of the sea. So even though you have that kind of faith, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. Amen. Now why is Paul emphasizing this? Are there going to be people in hell that have a lot of knowledge? Will there be people in hell that spoke many languages? Will there be people in hell that even had faith? Yes. But will there be anyone in heaven that doesn't love? So the essence of who God is, is love. That's why it says the greatest of these. I've gotten ahead of myself now. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now did Paul bestow all of his goods? He must have kept some fabric and a sewing needle and some thread because he was a tent maker. And so he's just saying, even if I did, 
Now Jesus came to one man one time and said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Of course, he was calling him to be an apostle. He's not calling everybody to do that. But Paul's saying, even if I did that, if I don't have love, even if I give my body to be burned, he says, though, that means even if. Did Paul give his body to be burned? Paul was stoned, but he was resurrected from that. Uh, he was whipped many times, but he survived that. He was ultimately beheaded. He didn't survive that. But nowhere does it say he was burned. So Paul is saying, even if I gave myself to be burned, if I don't have love, you know, I went to um, England a few weeks ago. I think I told you that one of the highlights of the trip for me was to go to see the church where John Wycliffe preached. Uh, just he was the morning star of the Reformation. He translated the Bible from Latin into English. Even before Luther translated his into German, you have Wycliffe. Matter of fact, the King James Version really is an evolution of the Wycliffe Bible and the Tyndale translations. And so he really laid the groundwork for changing the languages of the world. And he did such a great work of Reformation. Uh, and he was excommunicated by the Pope and they issued all these decrees against him and, and anathema. But he died in his church right after preaching, just had a stroke and died a few hours later. They buried him. And uh, it, it made the church so mad that they couldn't actually burn him to death like they wanted to. They dug him up 44 years later and burned him to ashes so that there, there'd be no place where he was buried. And then they scattered his ashes in this little creek I went and saw right there outside of the church, not far away. And so, because some used to think that, you know, if you're burned, God will not be able to resurrect you. He won't be able to find all the parts. You know, at least if there's some bones or something left, he can say, you know, it's like when you open up one of these things to be assembled. You get the A goes with the B to the C. And, and it's, you know, God, you know, he, he kind of like one of those old erector sets. He just, he gets it together and puts it all back. And, but when you're burned and the ashes are scattered, God just shakes his head and says, yeah, I can't do this. The church had a pretty small idea of uh, God's ability. So when Paul says to be burned, he's really saying, you know, the ultimate sacrifice is there is not even a grave left for you. See what he's saying? You give yourself, give all that you got, give your body to be burned, nothing left. He says, after you've done all that, he says, it's nothing if you don't love. Then he goes into the definition of love, and this will be in our lesson also. Love suffers long. It is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Then he goes back to his first subjects and he says, where there are prophecies, they'll fail. They're fulfilled, they're fulfilled and they're over with. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Can't talk all day long. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I want to pause here. When you're a baby Christian, we often focus on the childish aspects of being a Christian. We look so much at the external. We look at the actions. As you mature as a Christian, you realize the actions are the result of the attitudes. Christ said, it's not only a sin to commit adultery, but if you look on the opposite sex to lust in your heart, it's an attitude. It's not only a sin to commit murder, but you can commit homicide in your attitudes. And Jesus went on to say it's not just vowing and lying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest in your communications. It's, it's coming from the heart. So it's not just forgetting to wash your hands before you eat. That's not what defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth, which is a reflection of what's in your heart. And so the baby Christian, he's thinking about these external things. As you mature as a Christian, that's what Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. 
says, then you start realizing it's a change of heart, that the real fulfillment is loving God and loving your fellow man. That's the ultimate, the greatest um, motive in all that we do. That's the summary of the commandments of God. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Mirrors today are a lot more sophisticated than they were back in Paul's day. Uh, the mirrors, even back in Egypt, they would hammer out a piece of brass and they'd polish it as well as they could. And you had to be very wealthy to afford one that even gave somewhat of a distorted image. Best you could do maybe is to look down in perfectly still water that had a black background to try and get some kind of an accurate reflection. So mirrors were all a little bit obscured back then. And even the glass that they looked through was not clear glass. It was usually colored somewhat. Um, they, could, they couldn't get the crystal clear glass like we do today. And that's why I said, you know, now we see God through a glass darkly. And if you remember some of the old, I was going to say beer bottles. Why am I asking a church that question? <laughs> And they put it in brown bottles because it's supposed to keep it longer. But you know, it's uh, sort of, it gives you the idea though that our picture of God, do you know there are picture people that collect those bottles? I met a fellow one time and he was rooting around in an old dump up in the hill by some old homestead. I said, what are you looking for? He said, old bottles. I said, really? He said, yeah, I collect them. So yeah, I went to, I found one the other day and I took it to a collector's convention in Las Vegas and I got $4,000 for it. For an old bottle, one of these old colored hand-blown bottles. That was amazing to me. Anyway, see how easily I can get distracted? When I was a child, I thought like a child. <laughs> and I still have an attention deficit. Now we see in a mirror dimly our concept of God and the truth is obscured. We look on the outside. But then I'll know just as I am known. Now I want to pause there for a minute. A lot of people ask me, when I get to heaven, Pastor Doug, and grandma's got a glorified body. How am I going to recognize her? And how is she going to recognize me? Last time grandma saw me, I was eight years old. And now I'm going to be resurrected and I'll have a 30-year-old body. I mean, how are we going to all know each other up in heaven? And I like to point to this verse that says, uh, now we know in part, but then we'll know even as I am known. Our discernment will not be less in heaven with our glorified bodies and our enhanced understanding. We'll know people right away in the kingdom. Our, We'll recognize them even though it won't be the same on the outside. We'll still have an additional Holy Spirit to give us that discernment. We'll know who they are. And um, then it goes on to say, And now abides faith, hope, love. These three. Now that's, um, those are like the trinity of great virtues. Faith, hope, love. You know, you've, you've got to have faith and you've got to have hope and um, hope springs eternal, they say. Uh, all things are possible if you believe. But there'll be people that had hope, false hope, won't be in the kingdom. And there'll be people that had faith in the wrong things, won't be in the kingdom. But everybody that really loves God and loves their fellow man, and if that's the supreme, if they do that with all their heart, they'll be there. See, because that's the essence of who God is. And so, real love is what the, the purpose of the gospel. If I was to summarize and oversimplify the purpose of the gospel, it would be to reproduce in each of us the greatest of the spiritual gifts, which is love. My biggest problem is love. I don't love God enough. I don't love you enough. Don't know how to break that to you in case you didn't know. <laughs> and sometimes I read in the Bible and I look at the sacrifices people made in Christian history and I say, Lord, I guess I really don't love you very much. Uh, I want to love him more, don't you? Amen. And we got to recognize that. And so the purpose of the gospel is to recreate in us genuine love for God and for our fellow men. Now let's, with that lengthy introduction, we're going to go to our, our lesson for today, talking about the... Um, the fruit of the Spirit, love. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. Jesus said to him, the great command is, 
You shall love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is to be the ultimate uh, expression, to love the Lord. Did, now, did we get a microphone to you? You do, okay. Why don't you go ahead and read for us Romans 5.5. 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. All right, that's really a segue to this next question. How does God put his love in our hearts? What did that verse say? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the, the Holy Spirit. How can I love unlovable people? It's easy to love the lovable, but is God telling us just to love the lovable, or does he say to love the difficult people? Matter of fact, he says love your enemies. That's a challenge. How do you do that? Can we do it in our own power, or do we need a supernatural power to enable us to love those who are unlovely? It's through the Holy Spirit, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. What does love do? Now, we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter we're under, under the section, what does love do? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love suffers long. Now, what does it mean, suffers long? Does that mean that if you have love, someone's going to take a hot coal and put it on your elbow, and you're going to just take it as long as you can because you love? No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about we suffer sometimes with people mistreating us because of patience. We endure. Have you noticed sometimes people have children that are challenging and the first time the children misbehave or they get a phone call from the police station, the parents say, they made their bed, let them sleep in it. I'm through with them. Sometimes parents do that. But uh, why do you go down and bail them out? Why, why do you suffer long? because of love. Now sometimes we got to learn to practice tough love. I don't want to be enabling those of you who are going too far to enable your children that are manipulating and taking advantage of you. There's a time when we need to know how to practice tough love. Just one little faint amen will help me. Amen. I mean, you know, there's, there's a point where the way that you do love them is by don't letting them roll right over you. But love often goes too far towards mercy. What about the love of God? Did he execute justice right when we needed it or deserved it, or did he go a little too far with us on the mercy side? Is God, does he abound in mercy? He's long-suffering to us word. Isn't that what it says? Not willing that any should perish. So when it says love suffers long, we know what that means. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, God is long-suffering to us word. Because he loves us. He doesn't want us to perish. And it says, love thinks no evil. What does that mean? Does it mean if you really love God, no evil thought ever comes into your mind? No. Well, the more you love him, the more that you'll think on those things that are pure. But I think it's really talking about something different here. So often, we are suspicious all the time. And we don't trust anybody. But when you love, you give people the benefit of the doubt. I know this dear saint. <laughs> she was so loving. She's passed away, but I still won't tell you who her name was. I uh, knew her for several years. And um, because she was so loving, she always trusted everybody. And I used to think she needed to be a little more wise like a serpent because people took advantage of her. And I'd see what they were up to, and I'd think, how come you don't see it? And it's just because she was so loving, she just thought no evil. <laughs> it's like in the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam and Eve had never heard a lie, and that's one reason I think they were taken in, or at least Eve, so quickly, because love doesn't think evil. It, uh, it believes. Going on with that uh, same thought there, talking about what love does, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, Love for God, when you love God, people who love God go through all kinds of things and someone will say, after all that you suffered, how do you still love God? Did Job endure all things? Did he still love God? All right, somebody read for me 1 John, 1 John 
not the gospel. Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. I think I gave that to somebody. 1 John 4, 8, 9, and 16. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God, was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Well, the language of John is so lofty. Sometimes you think he's speaking in code. Uh, you wish you could visualize. What does he mean when he says love? But uh, John even refers to himself as, it's like he's amazed. He says, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. Did Jesus only love John, or did he love them all? Did Jesus even love Judas? Why does John refer to himself as the one whom Jesus loved? It's not because he was the only one Jesus loved. It's because he's amazed that Jesus loved him. And so he thinks of himself in the context of, he loves even me. I'm the one he even loved. You see what I'm saying? And so he's got this amazing uh, revelation, realization of what the love of God is. And he, he's called the apostle of love because of that. And then he goes on and he, he calls people. Those who say that they love God and they don't obey him, he says they're liars. If you really know God, you'll love him. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. What is the summary of love for our fellow man? Now, I gave that to someone. Andrew's got that. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. There is a formula. You know, in math, they've got some formulas, and they, it's amazing how they work. You just apply these laws, and you'll find the, the uh, answer to your equation. Well, here's a law that Jesus applies, and it works. If you want to know how to love other people, do to them what you want done to yourself. Now, why does Jesus use that equation? Because it's almost always true that we love ourselves. And so if you really love yourselves and you want to find out how to treat other people, treat them the way you want to be treated. Amen. So if you're not sure whether or not you should say something about somebody else, say, would I want them to say that about me? You know how you feel about yourself because you pretty much love yourself. <laughs> should I do this for that other person? Would I want them to do it for me? See what I'm saying? And so because we are also naturally, you know, we're kind of magnetized to ourselves, you just apply that rule of turn it around and say, what would I want? And do that to everyone else and you'll be fulfilling the law about loving one another. And by the way, if you really love your brother, you'll be loving God. Because Jesus said, the best way to show your love for God is to love each other. That's why he'll declare in the judgment to those who are lost, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me or in sick and you didn't come to me. And they'll say, when? He'll say, in as much as he did it not to one of the least of these. So the best way for us to show our love for God is by treating others the way we want to be treated. Amen. Because man is made in the image of God. You can't see God, but you can't see man. So if you say, I love God, I love God, I love God, but I can't stand the people. <laughs> the way to show your love for God is to love the unlovely. If you value what God values, you'll be showing respect for God. How much does God value sinners? And so by our showing love for sinners, and it's not easy. But you look at how Jesus treated them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It's not easy for me to say that when they do that to me. So that's the best way to show our love for God. And then it goes on. It says, what love doesn't do? New Testament's pretty clear that love is not primarily a positive emotion but a way of being. Love does not envy. Someone else you hear about has a windfall. Uh, something wonderful happens to them. And the carnal heart, the first thing you think is, oh, why couldn't that happen to me? Or someone's invited to a neat party but you're not invited the first thing you think about is how come I'm not invited we automatically seem to think about ourselves first but when you love you're happy for someone else's blessing you rejoice with them 
put yourself in their shoes and say, I, will, I can be happy for them instead of thinking, why them, not me? That's what envy is. Envy is just the kind of covetousness. That last commandment talks about that. Love is not covetous. It does not parade itself, and it goes on. The next one is like this. It's not puffed up. Now, do you know they've got some animals that when they try to scare away another animal, they'll raise themselves up, they'll take a, they'll puff themselves up like a frog. If you've ever been diving before, they got fish called puffer fish. And uh, they, they try to scare the other fish by they, they inhale all this water and they puff themselves up to make themselves ten times bigger than they are, try and scare the others away. And so I always think of that when Paul says they're not puffed up. And uh, you've probably seen there's some roosters, some birds. They inhale a neck full of air, strut around, trying to look bigger to the other rooster. Love is not puffed up. Uh, it doesn't strut. Try and get others to look and say, see what I've done? Paul asks this question, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake that you might learn in us, listen, not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one another, one against another. What was going on? They were kind of boasting against each other. Now that could never happen in a church because we all love each other. <laughs> Did it happen to Jesus' apostles? Does it happen when a church Someone is nominated to a position and someone else has passed by and they thought they should have had that position. Why did they get this position? I know so much more about that job and I could do it so much better. And, and all of a sudden there's this little, cam or when you know the office is open, then there's this campaigning on the side. Were the disciples arguing among themselves which of them was the greatest? It even happens at ministers' meetings. That's what happened with Jesus' apostles. It was a minister's meeting. And some will stand up and say, how many do you got in your church? Well, I got 100 in my church. Well, I got 150 in my church. You can hear pilots on the FAA radio. Ground control, this 5-2 Echo November. Can you please tell me what my speed is? 5-2 Echo November, you're going 130 knots. Ground control. This is 246 Bravo. Can you tell me what my speed is? Uh, 246 Bravo, you're going 200 knots. Then you'll get like an SR-71 Blackbird. They'll come on. They just can't resist. <laughs> ground control. <laughs> SR-71 Blackbird. What's our, our uh, ground speed? Mach 2. <laughs> That's a true story. A pilot on an SR-71 Blackbird told me one day he couldn't resist. He was flying around L.A. and all these private pilots were boasting about how fast their jets were going. And he's up there going 2,000 miles an hour. <laughs> Said he just, he just knew his navigator was going to call in <laughs> and say, L.A. traffic. Yeah. <laughs> All comparing ourselves, among ourselves, by ourselves. Is that love? Or are we being puffed up? Comparing ourselves, puffed up. Love is not puffed up. And I want to finish here what it said. I was reading 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. That no one of you might be puffed up against another. For who makes you differ from another? Think about it for a second. If you do have any talent that is superior, who gave you that talent? Who could take it away in the blink of an eye? Whatever your gift is. If your gift is singing, you could all of a sudden find that you can't speak like Zacchaeus. No, Zacharias. Or you might have the gift of piano and he could freeze your limb like he did of Jeroboam and you won't be able to move your hand. I mean, anything you've got is a gift of God. So why would you boast about something you don't really possess? Now you can strengthen your gifts. You can improve your gifts through practice and stuff. But even the, the ability to improve your gifts comes from God. So why are we proud? Uh, well, we don't really have anything except it's been given to us to use for his glory. And yet we strut around, puffed up, as though it's ours. And what do you have that you did not receive? And now if you did receive it, then why are you glorying as though you didn't receive it? Love is not rude. 
sometimes in the, um, under the pretense of being honest, I've seen Christians be rude. And they say, oh, I was just being honest. Uh, well, there, our speech ought to be seasoned with grace. And um, sometimes I used to like to shock people by how abrupt I could be. And, and it was crude. And it would get a reaction, even a snicker, but it was also rude. And I think the Christians ought to learn grace. We ought to cultivate good manners because we represent Jesus. And there's no virtue in being uh, crude or rude in our communications. Love is not easily provoked. It's patient. And, you know, I've had to learn this, but I think God's been good to me. And, uh, you know, when you're in a p position of visibility, you get a lot of criticism. And if it, you've got to develop a thick skin and start realizing, you know, the, Lord, Lord, this is good for me. I need this. And I read those criticisms, and some of them I say, oh, they're just being negative. And some of them I say, they, they made a good observation. I've got to write back and say, thanks, I needed that. You've got to be open. And sometimes you get good constructive criticism. When they tell me they don't like the way I do my hair, well, I just, <laughs> I, I usually just kind of shine that on. Pardon the pun. <laughs> not easily provoked. We should not take vengeance. We ought to let, when we love others, if you feel like, yeah, but I can't love them because they mistreated me. You just got to let God even the score. That's something we don't need to take care of. Luke 18, verse 7, And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry to him day and night, though he bears long with him? Isn't God, because of love, long-suffering? I knew this person, I won't identify, that was very mean to me. And I wouldn't want you to know the terrible scenarios I imagined of things that could happen to them. But I concocted in my mind all kinds of very creative things, bad things that would happen to them because they were so mean to me. And I'm ashamed to tell you this. But then uh, this person went through a genuine conversion and found the Lord and will now, I hope, be in the kingdom. And I was later convicted by the Lord and the Lord basically said, Doug, here you'd basically consign this person to the lost and you'd given up on them. You wanted all these terrible things to happen. And if they had even died, you wouldn't have grieved. Now they're going to be your brother or sister in the kingdom because their hearts were changed. Before they were just acting like lost people. So we've got to love people with the idea in mind this person is still a potential candidate for the kingdom. That's so hard to do when you're wanting bad things to happen to them. But God loves them. He died for them. And all of us were once those people. Amen. So, takes practice though. Love thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. All right, the test of love. You've heard it said, matter of fact, someone look up Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. Got that right here? Let's get your microphone. Hold your hand up so he can find you. And while we're setting up for that, I'll read Matthew 5, 43. And this is where it gets really tough. You've heard it said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you might be the sons of your Father in heaven. Everybody hates those that hate them. Jesus said you're to be unique in that respect. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you just love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, you do no more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you should be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, when we think about being perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, we usually think about just the perfect life. But Jesus here, he's talking about perfect love. As a matter of fact, in Luke, I forget the chapter and verse, Jesus said, be therefore merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. He talks about perfect mercy. All right, now someone read for me, I think it was Exodus 23, 4 and 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. 
So the concept of loving your enemy and showing kindness to your enemy and overcoming evil with good, is that just a New Testament concept or does that go all the way back to Moses? All the way back in the beginning, if you are to be divine, you are to love those and show kindness to those who might even be your enemies. And uh, Paul quotes that in verse also about uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him, give him drink. In so doing, they'll heap coals of fire on his head. And I, I don't think that means that uh, you just make them burn hotter. I think it means that their conscience convicts them. And that's how you break down that. Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. I gave that to somebody. Right you have that? All right, let's get to your microphone. While we're finding that, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. I'm going to look this up real quick. Romans 8, verse 35. This is this great passage that talks about the love of God for us. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does Jesus love everybody? Amen. Jesus loves everyone. He loves the good. He loves the bad. He loves us when we follow him. He loves us when we disobey. Though it makes him sad. And so God is love. All right, we're going to read in Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. I command you to love. That always kind of troubles me. You better love me. You love me? You better love me. I command you to love me. You see, sometimes, listen to this, Deuteronomy 11:22. For if you carefully keep these commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways. Deuteronomy 19:9. And if you keep these commandments and do them that I command you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love me to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. I mean, here we're being commanded. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're commanded to love. Why does he do that? Would you ever ask your children to attempt to do something they can't do? Or is it possible that love is not just an emotion, that love is also a choice? If God is asking us not to steal, can you choose not to steal? It's an action. If God is asking us not to kill, can you choose not to kill? Does it bother you when he says don't kill? You say, well, it's reasonable. He's asking me not to. Okay, I won't. You can exercise your will and choose to not steal, not kill, not commit adultery, not worship idols. So when he says, I command you to love, can you choose to love? Amen. You may not be able to choose the feelings and emotions, but you can choose to act in a loving way. And that's what Jesus is doing. You know what often happens? The emotion and the feeling will follow the choice. In your marriages, there's often a lot of trouble in marriages because they think love is just a feeling and emotion. If we believe that we can choose to love our spouses, and if God is commanding us to love, you, love him, and that's possible, then, and he's a lot bigger than uh, any person. If he's commanding us to love our spouse, we ought to be able to do that. If he tells us to love our enemies, we should be able to love our spouse, right? <laughs> I'm not that I'm trying to put the two together, I mean, but, and yet, well, you, you know, we're laughing, but you and I know it's true. There are a lot of people who say, well, why'd you get divorced? Lost my love. Love went away. Fell out of love. We, well, you just decided to stop loving. Huh? Isn't that what that means? You can choose to love. He commands us to love. He commands us to love him. We don't have a problem. He commands us to love each other. You can choose to love. And often 
the feelings and emotions then follow the choice. You can choose to forgive someone you don't feel like forgiving. And once you've made that choice, then something happens to your heart. When you act on the Word of God, it changes our hearts. So you choose to, and then it becomes real. All right, you know what? I've got just one more section here. I'm, I wonder if I've got time to talk about the Good Samaritan. You know, in one of these um, parables that Jesus gives us, he talks about what happens here, love and action. Luke chapter 10, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, What is written in the law? The law, you always think about commandments. How readest thou? He answered and he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. See, it's mind too, it's thoughts. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said unto him, You have answered correctly. You have answered right. Do this and you will live. And so this is the ultimate expression of love, is loving God with all of our hearts and minds, soul and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. But then what did the lawyer say to that question? Who's my neighbor? He wanted to break it down. So Jesus then tells the parable of what? The Good Samaritan? Who would normally have been considered to be an enemy of any Jew, and yet this Samaritan stops even when his own church members who maybe had the scriptures, who knew who this person was, who would have told them they love him in church, but they didn't demonstrate that love. His own church members, they went by, the Samaritan stops. And you know, I just, I always loved the, um, the examples that are given here of what he gives him. It says the Samaritan, he takes his, he binds up his wounds. With what? Probably his own clothes. He gives him his oil. Why? Symbol of the Holy Spirit. He pours in wine. Now who is the Good Samaritan in this story? You with me? The Good Samaritan is Jesus. That represents the uh, blood of the gospel, the blood of the covenant. He puts him on his own animal. Who does that animal represent? He didn't have strength to carry himself, so the animal carries him. He gives us supernatural strength. He gives us a strength that belonged to him. And then he takes his money out of the pocket. He brings him to the inn. That's like when we were brought to the church. And he says, I'll pay. He gives of his resources. He gives his time. It says he nursed him. And then I like the way the parable of the Good Samaritan ends. It says, then, he says, when I come again, I will repay you. Is Jesus coming back again? Will everybody be rewarded one way or another? You know, it's a, just a wonderful story that illustrates uh, the love of God for us. While we're separated, while we're strangers, He still loves us. Well, friends, I'm looking at the clock and it's telling me we're out of time. I want to remind you that we have a special offer and if anybody would like that, just call the toll-free number on the screen. It's the book Love Without an If. That number, once again, is 866-788-3966. We'll send you that just for asking. It's free. And I want to thank you again for studying with us. God willing, we'll be back together again next Sabbath to study His Word. God bless you. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org.